morning the gospel reading is found in the book of John, verses 1 through 15. It's one we're familiar with, the feeding of the 5,000, and it's the, the incident that is also contained in all four of the gospels, and each of the different gospels have just a little bit different uh, description of what occurred. Today, we hear the story of the little boy who was involved with the feeding of the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples, and the Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have even a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down. There were about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed those to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And he did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. And after the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain <coughs> by himself. How many times have you heard that story? Many times, right? It's a very, very familiar story to us, particularly around stewardship time. But I've learned, the more I study, the more I see, the more I understand what Jesus is trying to do. So we're going to put a little bit of a different twist on this particular story this morning, particularly related to stewardship. When Diane stood up this morning and read the Old Testament scripture from the book of Psalms, Psalm 77, you know, sometimes we have issues with the translation in the Bible, and hers was what was fine, but there was a word that mine has that hers wasn't using. And it was said of great wonders, Lord creates and does these great wonders. Mine uses a very more specific term. It says miracles. God, <coughs> God, <coughs> miracles. And that is very true. You know, our Bible from the very beginning to the very end is filled with the great wonders that God has done, the miracles that God performed, both God himself and Jesus as he ministered to the world, and even the disciples as they began the new church. Beginning, middle, and end, filled with the great works of God and the miracles that he's done. Perhaps the greatest miracle of all is the one that is touched upon in the story that we just shared of the loaves and the fishes. Where the people see the miracle that God performed through Jesus, and what do they want to do with Jesus, or Jesus do for them? They want to make him king, but not by force. See, perhaps the greatest miracle of all time is that God places Jesus as king, not by force, but by love and by grace. It's very different from much of our human experience when it comes to kings and governments and, and things like this. The ultimate king comes by love and grace. And for me, that's perhaps God's greatest miracle. One of the things we see throughout these miracles that God performs is able to create everything from nothing. 
literally everything from nothing. The very first story in the Bible, the creation story, is exactly that. All the heavens and earth and everything on them created out of nothing. We go a further in the Old Testament and we, we hear the story of the Jewish people wandering through the desert and every morning they're fed. They're fed from manna that falls from the sky and lands on the ground and they collect it. Again, God performing miracles from nothing to everything. And here in the loaves and fishes story we share this morning, we see that again. A very physical representation of God's ability to perform miracles. Five small barley loaves and two fish with 12 baskets of stuff left over afterwards. All this comes from a little boy, a small child. Not the grown men whom Jesus turns to to give the order to feed these people. God's able to do great things from very small and insignificant places. 5,000 men, plus the women and children, all fed. And not just fed, but fed so that they're full. They all had as much as they wanted and still left over. We know all this. We've heard the story. So why this miracle? What purpose does Jesus do this for? What's he trying to teach? And what does it have to do with stewardship? Well, I think it has a multiple things to do with stewardship. What's the... Uh, you guys all know this too, the, the four T's of stewardship that I like to promote. What are they? Time, talent, talent testimony, testimony, and tithe. Right? The four T's of stewardship. All of these are somehow manifest in this story. I want to take it just a little bit different this morning. One of the things that we practice as stewards is faith. I think I am touched on it. This is a story of faith. The little boy comes when Jesus brings the call to feed all these people. And he comes with simple faith. He just says, here's what I have. And he gives it. But what do the disciples do? They do what grown, mature people with lots of experience tend to do when they're given a task that Jesus assigns them. Very much what we saw Bob do this morning. Grumble. Grumble. How is this possible? Right? Their faith is much weaker, if you will, than a small boy. But God is even able to take their faith, small as it is, mustard seed <coughs> faith, and he feeds all this great multitude. So that's part of this miracle that Jesus performs. What else? To me, I see generosity in this small boy. He comes with a very simple meal. He's a poor boy. How do we know that? Because he comes with his five barley loaves. The barley loaves of bread back in those days was the cheapest bread you could make. He has very little. But with his simple faith, his trusting faith, he just gives it all. With no thought to himself. It's an example of stewardship. It goes on. Jesus gives the order. When he sees all the leftover stuff, what does he say? Pick it all up. Don't let it be wasted. This is a great example of stewardship in there. See, in the Old Testament, that's what they did with the man, right? They picked it up off the ground. The Jewish people believed that bread was a sacred gift from God, not to be wasted. So they picked it all up to use it at a later date. I can't help but imagine what our consumeristic society would look like if we were more diligent about not wasting the leftovers. Great example of stewardship. But I see a bigger example here. I see the ultimate example of stewardship in this story. The entire purpose of the four T's of, of our tithing, our time, our talents, and our testimony, the whole reason and purpose we practice stewardship, it's to care for people. 
to care for people. That's stewardship. See, in the Mark version of this story, Jesus feeding the 5,000, it starts off with Jesus seeing this great crowd, and he has compassion for them. It's very specific about using that word at the beginning of this story. He has compassion upon them. And what I find interesting is he doesn't use this compassion to immediately feed them. What does he do? He teaches them. He teaches them things that he knows will feed their hearts and strengthen their lives. He uses literally his own time, his own talent, he's the greatest teacher ever, and his own testimony of who he is and who God is to care for the people. He feeds everyone in this story. Not just the men, not just a few select people, but everyone who showed up. If you can imagine a crowd anywhere, anytime in history, coming to listen to one particular person or speaker, do you think every person in that crowd is committed to what that teacher has to teach? Absolutely not. But he feeds them equally without any distinguishing between status in their society, age, gender, it doesn't matter. He feeds them all. Not only does he feed them, he feeds them so that they're full, that they're content. I don't know about you. I prove that not that I've ever had just a meal of bread and fish, but I know I can eat an awful lot of bread and fish before I get full. That's a lot of caring that he showed through this miracle that he performed. See, caring for others, I believe, is the ultimate act of stewardship. I want to tie this story to another story that we hear very frequently during stewardship time. And that's the story of the widow and the two mites, the two small pennies. Remember that story? Where she walks into the temple and she puts in her two small coins and Jesus points her out? How many times have you heard that one as, a, as part of a stewardship message? I've heard it a lot. Now here's this woman who doesn't have much, but she gives everything she had. And this is lifted up as an example of great stewardship, which is valid and pertinent. But sometimes we have to be careful of Scripture. Because he, you, these stories come in a sequence, in a context. And the very verses in front of this can change the outlook on what Jesus is trying to teach with this story of the widow and her two mites. And I want to share that with you just briefly. It's a very short one. It's found in the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. He's teaching. Once again, Jesus does what he does so well. He's teaching his disciples. And it says this. They're in the temple. As he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men shall be punished most severely. This is where it picks up where we're all familiar with it. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. And many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a fraction of a penny. And calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. This poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. All that she had to live on. Why do you think Jesus puts these two things together, these two teachings? 
Is there something perhaps more going on than simply lifting this up, this woman up for doing what she did? Why would he start that particular teaching after he gives this warning about the teachers of the law who like to show off so much? What does he criticize them for? Devouring widows' houses. You notice in the story that he does not turn to the disciples and say to them, you should do what this woman has done. He doesn't say that. He just points her out. See, another way to look at this story is to put it in context with what he has just taught about the teachers of the law, that they literally use their influence and power to devour widows' houses. What if she has come into that temple because she's feeling pressure from those people in authority to keep her house? Do you see how this changes the whole context of that scripture and takes it out of the simple stewardship act of giving out of your poverty into something much larger? Into this issue that Jesus is trying to teach both here and with the loaves and fishes? That the greatest act of stewardship is taking care of people. And here he comes, he's criticizing roundly the teachers of the law for showing off with their long robes and taking advantage of others to, to make themselves better. Why? Because they're not practicing the ultimate form of stewardship. I firmly believe that stewardship, all those four T's, is meant for one purpose. To enable us through the power of God to take care of one another. To take care of people. To join with them on their journey. The loaves and fishes, when he's taking care of people, he's eating a meal with them. There's another great story of taking care, of, taking care of people in the Bible, which is the Good Samaritan story. Where the ones who know pass by this poor wounded man. But the Samaritan comes and he travels the journey with this guy, puts him on his own donkey, takes him to a place where he's cared for, pays for it. He spends time, he takes care of people. The ultimate act of stewardship. As we reflect on our own stewardship journey, our own stewardship pledging, our own means of using those four T's, I would encourage each of us to do some things, very simple things. To give freely, without compulsion. Give freely without compulsion. Give from what you feel the Lord is asking you and calling you to give. To be like a little boy. When you give without compulsion, just give generously. When you give generously like that, it's a, it's a statement of faith. It's saying to God, I understand that you will provide for my every need. I trust you. And don't waste your gifts. They're meant to be used for service of others. I believe this is the way stewardship is properly done. I believe if we join together individually as a church to, to do these things, Jesus will look down upon us with grace, and gratitude, and blessing. And we'll see that the 5,000 have been fed from our little gifts. And at the end of our days, we will hear those words, Well done, my good and faithful servants. Let us pray. For we, I, come to you like the disciples when they're asked to feed these many people. The first thing that comes to my mind is, there's not enough. How can we possibly do this? But through a small and perhaps insignificant young child, 
who shares generously with faith, you show that you're able to do everything with nothing. Lord, that is awesome. That is a great miracle. So as we gather today, as we, we leave this place of worship, to go out into the world to serve your people, to care for them, may you show your miracles to us. May we freely give and watch you provide. I pray these things in your Son's holy name. Amen.